scratch, wampum, dough, sugar, clams, loot, bills, bones, bread, bucks, money. Money is, at its essence, that measure. Here we are on the Joe Blow Football Show. I'm Jamie G. He's Magna Mills. And we're going to do the Ozark podcast. That's right. We're going to break down Ozark season two. We appreciate you listening, liking, subscribing, following, and watching. We did season one, our likes, dislikes, our grades. And now we're going to walk you through season two of Ozark. Magna Mills, general thoughts on this. Context, just so you remember, like Jamie G, seen all these. I have now seen all of these. I have watched all of them fairly recently. Jamie G, not as much, so I might be on a, up on a couple more details here. And I just want to say overall, I think it was an improvement from season two. I think that they definitely kind of settled into their being their own thing a little bit more as opposed to kind of the first season did feel like an algorithm engineered you know, that kind of blend of Breaking Bad, Narcos, and Justified. They still do have those elements going on here. I think they do a lot better job of kind of, you know, seasoning that soup, blending them together. I will say, like, overall, still not a fan of most of the stuff going on with the kids. They have occasional good moments, but not a big fan of the overarching plot line. I do like that this season used Wendy and her, like, just the way they used her and especially utilizing all of her political skills in previous experience and everything like that to kind of make her more of an equal. I thought that worked really well. And, and I think that, you know, while it is still, again, a little bit dark or whatever, they did make an effort to, to open things up and shoot it a little bit brighter. You're in uh, different spaces. You're not necessarily in the same couple of locations they featured before. You know, now you're venturing more into the political world, into the bigger cities and stuff like that. So overall, again, I thought it was a, a step up from season one. And I enjoyed it for the most part. And I thought it uh, finished strong. Well, it's all about the finish, right? And so, yeah, I, I think it was a step up from season one. It, it built on it perfectly. You, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Laura Linney, who plays Wendy in this. And gosh, I mean, her, her emergence in season two was just, it was just wonderful to see. A lot more than season one. It was like kind of, you know, we got teased with it a little bit. And to be honest with you, Mills, I still want more. Like, I'd like more Wendy. Like, I really like her character and I like how they're using her, her role in the casino, the ties into the political stuff where, where you kind of get a little bit of what her life was like before she went into depression, started cheating on Marty. Like, you know, all, all these things that they dealt with as a normal family and before this this crisis, <laughs> this nonstop crisis of, of, of laundering the money, right? So I really liked that. The death of, of Cade to me, when, when her involvement in that, was awesome. So, you know, I'm a big, big fan of Wendy here and her, and her emergence. I hope that that continues in season three. And we'll talk about that on the season three episode of Ozark podcast. But that, that was a big one. The casino boat, like, let's just start there, right? I mean, this was a plot line that we both wanted to see continue after watching season one. I really like what they're doing with this. It, it buys them kind of a, a bigger ticket item here in terms of how they're going to pull this off. It provides some realistic legitimacy to how they're going to launder all this money. It also creates a lot more risk and exposure to them. So I really like what they did here from that standpoint of, you know, again, it's, it's a solution in a way, but it almost creates more problems. And that's just so common with the birds, right? They just can't seem to stop stepping on their own dicks. I mean, you know, they, they solve one problem and boom, another crisis emerges. And that's what makes this show so good, but really like the direction the casino boat's going and excited to see that continue. Magna Mills, I got to just talk for a second about Darlene. Can we just talk about Darlene Snell? Dude, she is an absolute loose cannon and I love it. I love it. I mean, I did not see her poisoning her husband. You could kind of start to see there was trouble there, but that was a that was just such a balls move, starting the war with the birds. I mean, she is just a loose cannon that you don't think she's got a snowball's chance in hell of, of, of like pulling off anything and making it, but she just somehow finds a way. And I, Darlene's an interesting character here for me, and I really like her. Darlene, like I have my notes here, I just have like, Stuff like, holy fuck, what the fuck? This bitch is crazy. You know, I did want to point out that I'm not not a huge fan of the whole adoption plot line, really. I don't know if 
it, they really it's something they're going to pay off in some way if it was just an excuse to kind of bring the preacher back around or whatever overall it's kind of creepy to kind of have a, a kid like a baby as a chess piece like even breaking bad kind of shied away from that pretty quickly darling and again with the craziness or whatever but i thought one thing that they did a nice job one of my favorite moments kind of when you see that jacob like you see his side of it where he's kind of resolved to get the idea like oh shit he's probably going to kill her and you kind of see that how he goes to do it and he goes to slip of the knife and she's ahead and i think that kind of shows just how that she was really the brains of the operation most likely you know what i mean she is kind of the driving force behind the snells and you know it's a very touching scene everything like that with the way she does it there's a definitely shades of mags bennett from the second season of justified which is like a cool homage like they maybe go a little bit over the top with it here i, I do think she is a little bit the only thing that kind of makes me question is we've seen her for yeah, there's a problem with the show you don't know how long all this the time period is taking place over that bothers me a little bit we don't really understand sometimes how much time has passed we've seen her do some crazy ass shit so it does make me wonder how she survived for this long if she does crazy like it doesn't seem like she just started doing crazy ass shit so it's just kind of like wow like is she kind of like the the road runner just dodging shit and being kind of lucky is she that smart yeah, definitely an interesting character and total wild card in the show she's literally the wild card in the show yeah i mean she you, you you're spot on there i mean and but she you know she does look a little uh, you know a little a little worn dude i mean she looks like she's had a, a a rough go of it kind of i mean she she looks like she's been hardened and uh uh you know been through some lumps and bumps but you're right you know you made an excellent point magna mills when you talked about her being the brains behind it kind of driving force you know jacob had i think they were a really good couple in a way because jacob jacob had the ability to critically think and have some resolve she was more of a loose cannon and, and wanted to go on gut instinct and I like that balance that they created. And it also made it possible to build the tension to the point where they're going to have to kill each other. And that, that was, that was really cool. I think I have a feeling Darlene uh, will be somebody for a while on the show uh, for better or worse. And, and we'll find out, but she was definitely a cool add on in season two, when we lost the likes of Dell and we, you know, we needed to kind of get another emergence here of somebody that we liked um that 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 could carry this and you know and again going back to, to wendy's emergence becoming a bigger character i think that was really important w one thing we didn't talk about here with likes magna mills before we move on to dislikes is and we could talk about her forever but ruth right i mean ruth emerging as marty's apprentice here is both cool cute and scary as hell kind of it, it, it's it's a combination of things you know you see you see Marty kind of becoming not a father figure in a way, but treating her with a high level of respect that I think more leaders in leadership positions should do. He got her loyalty. And I think that was incredibly diff difficult to do. And he did that throughout season one and he's keep continuing to do it here in season two. And it's important because essentially she knows everything. And that's an interesting dynamic here for me, right? Is, is she really starts to learn the tricks of the trade i mean how, how, any thoughts on that magna mills for you like is that does it bother you is it does it does it lessen marty's skill set in your mind did you find it cool like i i kind of liked how they did this here oh absolutely i mean i think bruce the the real mvp you know for the the breaking bad analog movie she is jesse pinkman and we all i think the audience loves her i think the show knows that she is kind of like the most magnetic character that they have to work with it's, it's how they're doing a good job of giving her a, a lot to work with but like from a character standpoint i don't like how the show kind of like you can tell when we see marty talking with wendy and everything like he really does want to do right by her but then it, she always sees they, they talk at the wrong time and he kind of brushes her off and it keeps happening again sometimes this has to happen to create tension but it seems like he's not really trying to screw her over but he really gives if you're just watching not knowing his side you would think like oh yeah he's he's gonna screw her over so you understand where she's coming from and like she gets fucking waterboarded by the cartel and that kind of like never even really comes back around like she just kind of like sucked it up really like she's got a lot of bones to pick or whatever obviously at the end of the season i don't think she quite uh, you know finds it out yet but she she basically suspects that you know that they pulled the trigger on her pops even though she kind of knew you know we'll, we'll talk about that in our dislikes probably with her pops but yeah, dude. I mean, Ruth is is the all star. I feel a little bad. Like I really did enjoy her at the Lickety Split and everything like that. I would I wouldn't mind if that kept going for a while. I kind of liked her as a, you know the badass business owner or whatever. And you know she she seems to be trying to replicate that. She does that whole bit trying to get that uh, get the dock property or whatever there, and that just kind of never really worked for me. 
it just didn't seem to, to make a lot of sense or whatever. But yeah, I mean, she's she's great for the, you know, I have really almost no complaints about Ruth other than she has to interact with, like, she's the one who interacts with everybody. So as a character, like, she's always, like, she doesn't ever get a chance to chill. She's always just on fucking movie. On the go all the time. Again, her her love of her taste in music is something that also is a soft spot in my heart. I, I love Ruth's taste of, mer- of music. Um, she's always blasting something good. And uh, yeah, man, I just, I th- uh, Ruth is, like you said, she's, we love you, Ruth. Keep keep going. Yeah, you know, and I, I think we have to obviously shout out Buddy. Yeah. You know, I mean, Buddy, star who burned brightly, kind of became a little bit of a plot device, I think, because all of a sudden he could, he could do everything like he's out there you know he, he knows he's got mob connections he fucking is gonna go burn the shit even though he's sick as hell but i really like enjoyed i thought his funeral i thought the relationship from him and jonah was really good i think that's the best stuff that jonah's had to do really in the entire show has been his relationship with buddy and how he got everyone to come to the funeral and kind of pay respects and everything like that and kind of trying mm-hmm. to, to do right by him and everything i thought that was pretty fucking great and where do you stand on Helen? Okay, so I've been saving Helen because I, okay, I have her uh, I have her in my dislikes, but it's but it's hit or miss with me. You know, it's such a and we can talk about it right now. I mean, it was it was a very, very stark difference from what we saw in season one with Dell with with the new cartel person. And I remember when I left season one, you know, and, and awaited season two, I was kind of worried in a way about how they would replace Dell because I thought that character was important. And he did a really good job. It's like, okay, I understand what they, they had to kill him off and it worked and it, and it brought in the, the, the Snells right into the mix here as, as real permanent players in this show. But I was worried about how they, how they would replace him. And I didn't think we would, you know, immediately get like the boss or something like that. Like that's never going to happen. Right. But I don't know how I feel about Helen because sometimes it really works and other times I don't like it. Like she's not, it's just not enough for me. I don't really care. Like she just doesn't, she just doesn't do it. And that, I think that's probably the biggest thing for me is it was interesting. The storyline because the positive here is I like just me, myself, the inner workings of how an operation like this would pull off, right? When we're talking this type of money, you know, there, there are, there are attorneys, there are CPAs, the, you know, the, the, all sorts of advisors and shit here involved. I thought it was cool as another layer of this, of this ability to kind of launder money and, and kind of blend white collar crime with just flat out criminal enterprise. And that was interesting for me. But on the other hand, I personally think I liked like a Dell type of cartel person in the show more than a Helen. I think I agree with that for the most part. And I think they just, again, Helen, you know, it's been just kind of inconsistent. Like, I think at one point, she's, they're trying to play her off as kind of sympathetic to the birds. At the other point, they're trying to make her like a Dell, like kind of like a, a kind of scary person who could do anything. And I just think it's inconsistent. I don't really think it's on the actress. I just think she's asked to kind of be whatever the plot needs her to be. It's not, you know, I think the idea of the character is pretty good. And they tried to give her some depth and some nuance and everything like that. Again, I think I just prefer Dell. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things where they're going to have like a cartel person of the season kind of deal, a thing they keep turning over. Is she going to stick around? And I will say, this is something that'll probably transition well into our dislikes. It's one thing that I did like is towards the end of the season, they started calling some characters. Like the story has been expanding, expanding, expanding. And there are these characters that they don't really know what to do with. And some of whom I didn't like, you know, say, obviously, Rachel who's just been absolutely wasted. Like she could have just been like on two or three episodes as a guest star in the first season and been gone and just talked about off screen. Like, Oh yeah, she's home doing something. And it really wouldn't have mattered. And uh, Jordan Spiro, great actress. Like I feel bad for her kind of like, I wish they'd found something for her to do. Uh, they get rid of Roy, the FBI agent, obviously I was never a fan of that whole thing. They get rid of Cade, but Bruce's dad again, not a fan. So I'm not saying like, yay, they killed people, but I think that these weren't my favorite characters. I think the show already had too many characters to properly service. So I thought it was a really good sign that they kind of know what they're working with now. They're kind of like, all right, we're going to trim some fat here and get ready and like kind of really hit the ground running in season three. And that left me, you know, excited coming out of season two to watch season three. So I think, you know, that's, that's pretty important and it's a good like, but on the other hand, there's 
a reason I was kind of happy they killed some of these characters, which I'm, you know, probably talking about. Yeah, no, I, you're spot on there. I mean, and, and, and look, man, what makes something suspenseful is seeing, seeing an end to some things. Right. And so I like that they kind of mm-hmm. saw some of these storylines through Be- Mills, before we go into one, our dislikes, I have one more like that I want to talk about. I like the storyline of the Kansas city mafia. I thought that was cool. I, I like bringing in another, like it doesn't need another element of crime, right? There's enough organized crime to go around, but I, I just, I don't know, man, to me, that was kind of cool. And I, I, I liked it. Like it worked for me. Did you have, did you have an opinion on, on like the Kansas city mob storyline and, and where that may or may not be going? Yeah. I mean, I, I like the idea of it. It makes sense, obviously, especially when you're getting into unions and trucking and money laundering, it makes sense that the mob is going to kind of, you know, what the proverbial beak there and everything. I thought that their portrayal was kind of inconsistent. They're kind of portrayed as like a huge threat one minute and someone you can kind of push off until later if you need to. And I yeah. thought it was a little random that Buddy kind of like, like he, they had no other in and then they just go to the guy they happen to live with and he's got an in. You know, that's a little bit of a, a plot convenience. But overall, like the actor who plays uh, Frank Sr., I like quite a bit. I've seen him in other stuff. He's generally pretty good. I thought he's got good presence. I buy him as kind of a mob boss or whatever. So, you know, shows can really kind of fuck they can go too over the top or what have you when they try to do like the real like organized crime, especially the kind of old school mob stuff. And I thought they did a good job here portraying a guy. You felt like he could have guest starred on the Sopranos and you would have bought it kind of like he would fit into the universe as, as kind of a realistic mobster. So I like that aspect of it. Definitely. Definitely. And, and like you said, it's a, na- it's kind of a natural emergence here for us as you, as you start to get into, like you said, the, the, the union and the more traditional mob, piece of the organized crime that 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 runs things so let's move on to some of the things that did not work you mentioned one of the characters i'm going to start right off with a man and that's kate bruce dad this to me there was just so much lack of substance with him and it really just bogged down our best character and ruth with a shitty storyline that just kind of continued like i wish they would have did something with him other than just you know taking the chalk on tough loose cannon gets out of prison and abusive and just just you know out to out to screw over any everyone to get what he wants and the whole baby girl thing like it just it didn't work and i wish like i said lack of substance wish they would have did something different with him and i really just found it bogging down and taking away time from ruth doing other shit that we want to see and that was one of those things it never worked from the parole hearing to then you see him like what does he like drop his pants and like piss like right like on his parole officer or something like that she tries to get him a job with marty and he asks for a no show then he goes to the strip club and fucks with ruth's fucking money there's no redeeming quality to that character i don't think other than i think you're trying to make ruth they're trying to set up the the, the two dads thing kind of with him and marty i get what they're trying to do from a narrative standpoint it just doesn't work here because her dad is so terrible she, and ruth is so smart she's so like streetwise and just commonsensical and anybody else she'd get a cold and i get it they're trying to like that is her blind spot or whatever but i don't it, it doesn't quite work for me you know i maybe i don't think the actor did a bad job it just didn't it didn't have real chemistry with anybody else i don't think and they didn't give him anything good to play either so you know just kind of something that i could tell i think when she went to see him in prison or whatever i was like i don't think this is gonna be yeah. my cup of tea kind of the, the only redeeming thing with Cade, like you said, is the way he was killed, right? W- Wendy's role in that, like that, that was very cool. And again, it creates, it took a shitty storyline and it ended it and it created something that might be cooler stemming from it that could carry on throughout the rest of the show. So, so I was a fan with how they handled the Cade situation, but man, oh man, did the trip to get there suck massive dude that was like you're stuck in the back seat in between your two older brothers in the station wagon you got no music it's hot as shit and you know you're just getting elbowed dude like that's not a fun ride man that's not a fun I'm, ride and that's what it was with kate i mean to a certain extent it, it feels like he was kind of reverse engineered he was like the janice answer because you had you have a question you have to deal with somebody but you know obviously we have to deal with kate but first we have to deal with roy the fbi agent the cartel they're not going to hit, they're not really, from what I understand, they don't generally in this universe go after federal agents or shit like that. So they have to deal with this guy still. Somehow they did the thing with his mom and the heroin, which was fucking, that shit was cold, dude. Like Marty doing that, like telling the cartel guys to go shoot up his fucking mom. That that was some, that was Marty like, you know, between that and obviously when he had the the, the thing with the preacher and, you know, I know he didn't mean to kill him, but he still fucking killed the dude. So 
you know, Marty's kind of starting to get there. And I, and I like that they're, they're dragging him down there, but just the, the fact that they had to get rid of this FBI agent somehow. And it seems like that was Cade's job because they don't, you don't mind him killing Cade, but then they, I don't know that they had the balls to ask, you know, even if the cartel would with it, <laughs> Marty Bird asked him to kill an FBI agent. Cause that's going to also fuck with them in the, you know, in the future, how is that going to play out with the storyline? So I, I do feel kind of like they had to they had to do the two dads thing that he could kill Roy and then he's gone. You know, it was a one season character or whatever, and it kind of felt like that from the beginning. So you know, it, it just kind of reads as more of a plot device than a, like a fully fleshed out character that you know maybe it would have made sense to hold a Ruth's dad thing for another season down the road here, let her and Marty get closer, then bring him in. Yeah. Well, at least, you know, every silver lining has a touch of gray. At least there was that touch of gray. You you mentioned Marty when he kills the, you know, the pastor, uh, Mason, and it, it, Marty's mental breakdown after that, like, I just wasn't a fan of, man. It's like, look, dude, you've already done so much. You've already seen so much. You literally watched homie get thrown off the roof and brains splattered on the ground in front of you you just quietly got back in your car and drove you've had a fucking toenail ripped off you like i get it killing someone's a different thing but dude at this point i just didn't buy his complete mental breakdown here and i just to me that was a real low part part of the uh, season two again the entire that entire plot line has never ever worked for me with the the preacher, I do like that they actually confirmed that, yeah, the Snells did actually kill the wife and buried her or whatever. So at least you got some, it's not like one of those, the Russian in the woods still or something. I do like that they gave some clarity to that. I mean, it seems like they existed basically to have this baby that could then be used as a chip all over the place. And that's just really uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Like they're basic, like an infant is more or less like a, a chess piece to be used right now. And that's just, the show's got enough going on. I don't think they needed to kind of do uh, go down to that level or something like i know they're trying to be a little bit shocking and do something different or whatever but yeah we, we could probably live without it what, what one more thing that that jumps out here is um it's it just feels like at times particularly here in season two we're too dependent on murphy's law with the birds and them getting away like like if it can happen, it will. And then they'll get away. Like, it just seems like that's too, we're too dependent on that. And that that's one thing that started to kind of creep up on me here as we, as we got through season two in terms of just, um, you know, leaning too heavily on that dynamic for this, for this season. I literally can read verbatim from my notes right here. Uh, I like the idea that they're trying to put Marty in can't win situations, but if he keeps finding a way out, they're going to lose their impact. You know, it's like how Breaking Bad tried to be careful. Like, yeah, they wanted to, to write Walt into a few corners, but they didn't do it like every two episodes or something. Or if it was a problem, is one he could actually figure out with like science or something, not basically needing right. like five different things to go right for it to happen. Like, yeah, did that happen once or twice in the series? Sure, but not on an every week thing. And sometimes here, it seems that Marty, again, it's like he's playing Survivor. Like, yeah, he's got a plan, but he's also got to get pretty goddamn lucky. And, you know, again, you get the idea. He is, you know, I think that's the one thing that you couldn't, you're trying to figure out is like where how does does marty really does he feel trapped you kind of see that at the end of like does he really think they're ever going to get out is that kind of just a pipe dream does he really think they can do it is that really what he wants you know i think that's one thing here is you're trying you're starting to see what wendy wants she loves his political shit and everything like that in marty you, you just i think he likes the idea of the, the casino and everything but he just strikes me as a dude who's just somehow just like kind of like pinballing from thing to thing without any real plan despite the, the fact that he's supposed to be this kind of brilliant guy and just a you know a couple things we didn't really touch on is obviously i said it about rachel just again total waste of the character they didn't completely write her off they sent her to rehab in miami you know the whole thing is her as an informant just none of it really worked for me it was too over the top and then like especially that idea when he like one of like he did like the fake execution and shit like that was just way way over the line so that's why i don't mind again with cage fucking murked him like it was like just get rid of this dude thank you whatever if you're gonna use the fbi reset that plot do something different and then uh, uh charles wilkes kind of like the the billionaire donor stand-in dude i think the actor did a good job of being like a slimy rich dude but I will say again to bring in another like another show, he seemed like he was doing a guest spot on Billions, and, you know, and it was here. But like all of that kind of like I like some of it, like when they were when Wendy was doing the blackmail stuff and everything like that. I actually liked that quite a bit, and enjoyed it. I didn't really mention that specifically in the likes, but that showed how good she is and that she actually does enjoy the, this political job so much, even if it is kind of you know 
not completely above board and what have you. Again, I thought the actor did a good job, but I thought the character, again, just basically existed as a plot device to help them get the things that they could get for a casino. Because realistically, there's no fucking way these people would have ever been able to get a fucking casino license or like, just fuck no. Like, just knowing any, like, fuck no. But, you know, that's the one feasible way you can do it is having, you know, the super rich donor guy who got all the political favors. But again, then late in the year, you, you find out he doesn't really have like money in that or whatever. So then why does everybody keep kissing his ass? It doesn't quite, you know, again, the writing here isn't perfect, but that's why the character just didn't. If he was interesting, you'd want to keep him around. I was like, yeah, all right, let, let's build a casino, get rid of this fucking guy. One thing that was really odd for me, uh, and I, I have this as a dislike because it's just so weird. Doesn't it feel like they do a shitload of stuff? Like like a shitload of stuff happens and like a million different things like every episode, but it, it drags a little kind of, right? Like it, it just felt like for as much stuff that was going on, like a shitload of stuff, but for then it to drag just a little bit here and there was different. Um, so that, that was an odd thing for me where usually when we're, you know, some of the shows that we're going to compare this to and we've brought up some of the, you know, some of the great ones like the, Breaking Bad and some of the other ones. It never kind of drags on. Like it's always like exciting and not every episode is edge of the seat, but it doesn't ever really feel like it's dragging on. There's parts of this year where throughout season and season one, honestly, where a little bit, it kind of feels like even though all this shit's going on, it's dragging just a little bit, just a smidge. I would say the producers agree with you. I think that's why they landed on this 14 episode seven and seven structure for the final season. Yeah, because I think that they figured that out. They probably were padding it out just a little bit. And to do that, though, you have to, again, start shrinking down the number of characters. Like, look at Game of Thrones when expanded so far. You have to start eventually killing people because you can't actually, if you have 50 characters or whatever, you know, just you, you're going to only get to, like, see a couple of them every episode, like, once or twice a year or something. You're not going to be able to really have any sustained, you know, character growth. And people will forget. You know, if you haven't seen a character for six episodes, sometimes, like, someone flashes up i think we'll see something like that next season where you see somebody i'm like am i supposed to know who this is or not i think it really behooves them to kind of shrink it down a little bit figure out who your core is go from there and again trim some of the fat although i will say i think in season three you don't have as much of that problem as you had in the first two seasons where it did feel like there was a little bit that you could call maybe filler or what have you mills i gotta ask you something man with this one before we before we grade this thing it was weird for me here because i started to kind of think about them never getting away or being brutally killed. Like it, it's weird though, kind of, cause I don't really want the birds to get away. Not in the same way I wanted Walt to, 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 to get like free, like, and be okay and get done with it or Jesse, you know, or I wanted Tony to like not die and Tony Soprano to, uh, to, to get away with it and his life to be, go on and be fine, you know, or Philip and Elizabeth, like, you know, I wanted them to like get back to Russia and like, just enjoy the rest of their lives. Like, even though they were bad and, uh, you know, they, they should get what's coming to them. I was really pulling against them. I'm kind of indifferent about the birds here a little bit. Like, it's weird. Like on one hand, like, I don't really care if they ever get away. On the other hand, it's like, do I want to see them brutally murder? I don't know. Like, and I just find this, I find this to be a strange spot to be sitting in two seasons in to what will ultimately be a four, four and a half season s series. Where are you on this, Mills? Like overall, like, do you, do you worry like about the birds? Do you want to make sure that they're like, they can actually maybe get to Australia or wherever, or do you want to see them, you know, hacked up and, and at the bottom of the uh, Lake Ozark? I mean, what, what thoughts on this man? Or do you not care? Like, do you find yourself not caring? I mean, just please get these two more things out the trunk first, you know, before we want to help mama to the bottom of the lake. But I, th I think it's hard now because I have seen season three to say this, like, cause I'm pretty clear now. I think I have a pretty good idea of what I might actually want as the resolution of the show after season two. I don't know. Like you said, I, I don't think I really, it, you could have done the, they go to jail ending. I would have bought, like, I, there's almost no ending. I wouldn't have bought at that point. You can buy it somehow they get away with it. Somehow they go to jail. They go to witness protection. They get murked. One gets murked. One doesn't, you know, I would have bought almost any ending and not necessarily been mad as long as they, they pulled it off well. But now I, I will say that we'll probably get around to, you know, our season four predictions here or things we'd like to see. I do have a little, I think I have an ending in mind. Can't wait for it. We're certainly excited. Uh, make sure you continue to tune into the Ozark podcast. We got it covered as season four comes upon us. Uh, but until then, We'll keep you keep you going to season two 
and CC3 right here on W Balls, DJ Easy Dick. Now, Magnum Mills, I guess it's time to give this thing a grade, right? I mean, we, we let's, let's put it up against season two. You mentioned at the beginning, you think you like this one a little bit better than season one. And I think I'd probably agree with that. But where does this thing land on the Richter scale for you? And, and how would you grade season two? And did it do enough to have you pumped and ready for season three? Um, to the second question, yes, I think it did. I think it, the season finished strong. I think especially the last stretch about the last uh, three, four episodes was was really good. Maybe the best stretch of episodes that the show had had to that point. Definitely left me on a high note looking forward to season three. Um, I think I gave season three kind of like a, a solid passing grade, I believe, like a C, C plus in that 75 range. I don't think I'm, I'm taking this one, you know, up into the 90s or in that A range. But I think you're looking at somewhere here like soft B soft B call like you know and an 82 percent or something like that you know pretty good like you're you know you can take that home to, to my pot ain't too bad yeah man hey I mean you, you might not get a brand new N- N64 game for for getting an A plus but you're not you're damn sure not going to be in trouble for that so I think I kind of gave Ozark season one the same season two really like you said there was that stretch here where I started to become hooked where I started to be like, damn, this is a good show. Like I'm, I'm into this and I, I, it becomes totally binge worthy, you know, as, as we get into this season for me, this, this is, this isn't, you know, if we're, if we're grading at hundred to the best, this is like an 85 to 87 for me, let's just split it and say, this is an 86. So I'm right there with you, Magnum Mills. I'm right there with you. It's not perfect, but it's pretty freaking good. And I mean, it's not the greatest love in history, but it's, it's at times outstanding. Like it's, it's very well done. And yeah, there's some weak parts here and there and some things that we didn't like, but for me, this, this season was great. And it really had me pumped about season three where I was like, damn dude, I'm going to like blow through season three. And that's exciting when you find a show that makes you want to do that. And I think that's a big thing here that Ozark can feel proud of accomplishing. And they've also done a great job building some suspense around season four, which we will talk about eventually when we get to that episode of this podcast i'm glad you got me into the show not going to be one where you look at like every episode was the greatest thing but i think it, it's a good set of building blocks where they started out and they figured out who they are and it's getting better as it goes on and that's really what you want to see from a show at least in my standpoint is like when they're coming out of season two like they've really all right they figured out kind of who they are because that usually sets you up for that like three season stretch from like season three to season five where it's still kind of like new that they're not kind of rehashing old shit but they've kind of figured out the formula now so they're working under optimal performance conditions and you know i'm really that's what i'm hoping for here and i have seen you know season three at this point i do feel that is what happens so it's a good time and we're going to talk about season three if you just stay right where you are you're going to hear it in a minute to find us really all you have to do is on your favorite podcast streaming platform search for the ozark podcast you'll find us there we're from the joe blow football show I'm Magna Mills. He's Jamie G. You can find all of the Joe Blow content at joeblowfootballshow.com. That'll bring you right to our YouTube page where you can also watch this instead of listen to it as a podcast. When you're there, if you could, please subscribe to our channel. That way you don't miss any of our content, which is always free. And if you could give us a like, really appreciate it. We've also covered the 15th season of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia on our podcast, Night Pod Cometh. Find Nat on your favorite podcast streaming platforms at Nightbot Cometh. The Joe Blow Show is on social media at Joe Blow Show. And you can find all of our fantasy football, dynasty, wagering, and DFS content at Seize the Gap FF on social media. Thanks for listening. We'll be back with more Ozark Podcast. Peace and love, people. Love money. Can't spend it till it's clean.
so fucking focused. Yes.